I'm Eddie Sandage, and welcome to your finance TV's Crypto Revolution, covering all things crypto and digital assets. How you doing, Adam? We are, sorry, we're back here with Adam Blumber, co-founder of Interaxis. I apologize, but how are you, Adam? I'm I'm doing well, Matty. Hey, I need no introduction, right? I, that's that's the what I was going towards. You know, the nameplate's there, and everyone knows Adam Blumbo from Interaxis. So, you know, there was no introduction necessary. But uh, before we do get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to stay on top of our content. We are through five thousand followers, so thank you very much uh, for your continued support and uh, carry on doing what you're doing. It seems to be working. So, you know, there's always something to talk about in the world of crypto and uh, digital assets. But, uh, you know, obviously there's an awful lot going on at the moment in the Middle East, um, some very horrific scenes and such, and, and obviously I don't want to get into that. But it's, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with the, the Israeli people who are going through an awful time at the moment. Um, and excuse me, sorry, I have a throat tickle as well. Um, but, uh, you know, there's there's been some interesting moves in the markets. I'm, I mean, the broader markets as well as the crypto markets. Um, I personally, I thought there'd be a lot more weakness in the broader markets after what was going on in the Middle East um, and the dollar and such. But we, we did see some weakness um, and some liquidation in some of the crypto markets, uh, which I found a little bit surprising that we saw one and not the other and, and, and maybe... You know, there's a decoupling or something, but do you think there's uh, any any big picture thoughts on your side on this? Um, the the big picture thoughts are yes, if if we understand kind of the investment theses behind crypto and, and especially behind Bitcoin in in this case, in theory we should say okay, there's a a war going on. If we think that especially the U.S. and other countries might get dragged into that, as as uh, we haven't quite got gotten dragged into Ukraine yet, but money going there, there's wars going on, it, it affects a whole lot of people. The investment thesis behind things like Bitcoin is, yeah, money's going to flow into assets like Bitcoin because people are going to want some sort of safe haven. They're going to want some place to put their money that if, if it's the case of I live in one of these areas and I need to move my assets somewhere where I can get out of the country and my assets come with me, Bitcoin is is part of that crypto is part of that if it's i just want a safe haven because i don't know how much money the u.s government's going to print to fund a war i don't know what's going to happen with oil all of those things yes it seems like bitcoin would be a safe haven but we also have to remember many that right now most people probably don't invest in bitcoin and crypto thinking it of it as a store of value and investment thesis they think of it as speculative as i want to get my two three four five x on my money. And therefore, when the prospect of I might not have as much money or there's a war comes in, that's when you go, oh, well, I'm going to sell everything and go to cash. Right. That's, I think, the immediate thought for most people is when something bad happens, I'm going to sell and go to cash. We saw the same thing a couple of years ago when Russia invaded Ukraine. Right. We immediately saw a downturn in pretty much all markets, but the crypto market, especially, uh, which is what I was watching. And after a little while, maybe what we'll see is it kind of pick back up. Uh, now, keeping in mind that when you see price movements in, in crypto, it's not necessarily accompanied with uh, volume of, of movement, right? Because most people still, I think there's a record 75 or 80 percent or something of wallets holding Bitcoin have been holding it for longer than a year. So when we see that there's movement in the price, it's not necessarily institution selling or large holder selling. It could be you and me going on Coinbase or Kraken or something and selling. Well, that drives the price down no matter what, whether or not Michael Saylor or, or Tesla or whoever sells, they probably won't due to you know the situation in the Middle East, but you and I might. And technically that means you know from an exchange perspective, from an Oracle perspective, the price is going down. And we're talking, you know, ultimately about 100, 150 million bucks, which really in the grand scheme of things is is very little. It's not really that crazy a liquidation that, uh, you know, you might see that's you know, a day's trading in a, in a couple of these stocks. It's nothing. Right. It's not that much. And then, as you mentioned, many the liquidation start, right? Price goes down a little bit. Liquidation start because people in other parts of the world, not the U.S., are able to trade using margin. Uh, so if they're 10x, 50x, 100x leverage, the price moves down just a little bit. They get leverage out. They get margined out. The price goes down more because it's forced selling, you know, due to, to programmatic changes. So 
yes, it drives the price down a little more because those big buyers are not coming in to prop the price up. So as you and I are talking, I know there's been a big downturn in the price, but I don't think it's been accompanied with volume. That's very true. Very, very fair point. And I always forget about the leverage guys. Um, you know, things always get exas- exasperated uh, after some of the leverage that's in the system. Um, another piece of news that hit the, the wire was, uh, you know, the guys at Goldfinch, the DeFi platform Goldfinch. I, I think we've discussed Goldfinch in the past on the, plat- on, on the show. Um, but it does seem there was a, a $20 million collateralized loan that was made. The and the proceeds that were invested may not have been as wisely invested as they should have been, or they're just not performing as well. Um, talk to us because I think there's you know, it's bringing these RWA lending facilities under scrutiny. So, you know, what are your thoughts? Right, and this by is the way, like- RWA is like IRL, so real world right. asset in real yeah. life. You know, I'm getting, I'm getting the lingo from the kids now, so uh, yeah. yeah. You're doing a really good job with it, Matty. I I appreciate that you're you're trying so hard to be one of the cool kids. <laughs> I'm going to have a hoodie next week. Yeah, perfect. So uh, Goldfinch in this case, this is kind of hard because this is the second time it's happened to them. And the idea of Goldfinch is money comes into their pools, usually in the form of you know digital money, whether it could be stable coins or other crypto assets. It goes into a pool and then goldfinch or 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 warbler labs who created the goldfinch protocol basically says we're going to take some of this money uh in in a certain pool and um kind of give it to an underwriter who's going to lend it out to some company who wants to borrow it uh, and it's based on some you know collateralization terms and such but the idea of goldfinch was let's get some money in a in kind of this decentralized way where anyone can contribute to to these pools People, especially that might not have access to the financial system, that might not be able to participate in in opportunities to generate income like this. Let's try to get some money into some of these companies, maybe in areas of the world where they normally wouldn't have access to loans, where they normally wouldn't have access to banking and such. Let's try to get money from Adam and Medi and people all over the world that might want to contribute $500 or $1,000, pool it all go lend it out to those elsewhere in the world that might not have access to loans or might not have access to business or the interest rates are so high that it doesn't make sense for them. That's kind of the idea of Goldfinch. Now, in what, what happens in practice is we don't really have good ways to make sure we collect from those companies. And, and on top of that, many of those companies are in jurisdictions where we're not going to be able to collect. There's not a necessarily a great legal process to, to go through and protect that that loan. So what we've seen now is this is the second time that a that a company that has borrowed money from another company who borrowed it from the Goldfinch pool is in the process of defaulting or is not paying the the loan back. And sometimes it's, you know, based on the fact that that company is just not making money and they're not able to pay the loan back. Sometimes it's because uh, they didn't necessarily do what what they said they were going to do with the money. Right. So of a $20 million pool, it looks like 7 million of it seems to be likely to not be recovered. Right. Or, or maybe not all recovered, or maybe some of it will be recovered. Now that's a, a big hit to take. Right. Especially after there was a $4 million hit earlier in the year, uh, money that was loaned to a, I believe a Nigerian uh, robo taxi company that was not repaid. And, and they're in the process of trying to collect that. And now we see a second one. So yes, th- this this doesn't look good. Um, and I want to caution just to say one, I I know the Goldfinch team really well, and they're really good people, and and they've been really you know trying to implement this. And what we're finding out is the the theory and the practice are not necessarily matching up quite as well in terms of how uh, how it's structured, the the uh, amount of risk, the amount of allocation, the underwriting that needs to be done. I think the one problem is the amount of money loaned to one particular company at, at a time, the, the amount of that as a percentage of the pool and the associated risk with it is maybe the amount loaned to any particular company has to be brought down significantly mm-hmm. if they're not able to collateralize that loan with something. So I think that's a, a bit of what we're seeing. The other caution is we, we say this is real world assets, right? But this is just lending, right? It's not like 
we're using this money to go buy a security or buy a loan from someone. We're actually lending it out. Yes, it's to a real world company, but it's different than what we've talked about in the past with tokenizing U.S. treasuries or tokenizing a you know a private real estate investment. It, it all comes under this huge headline of real world assets because it's not all pure crypto moving back and forth, but it's using kind of these crypto and DeFi rails to get money uh, to people who are trying to borrow it for you know the betterment of their own business. So, you know, it's, I guess it's RWAs and IRL in the loosest possible terms in, in this in this particular Exactly, case. exactly. It's, it's more IRL than RWA. How about that? There, there we go. And not, well, no, I'm not even going to go down that route. Right. But, um, yeah, something else that came into my head that shouldn't have. Okay. So, um, yeah, okay. So we'll definitely keep an eye on how these things start panning out. But, uh, you know, it, it, it does, you know, there needs to be more caution thrown into these things and a little bit more deep dive. And, you know, so we'll, we'll see how this all you know, unravels and hopefully right. it isn't the full 7 million and it's just a fraction of it. Um, I think we should dedicate the rest of the show to uh, BlackRock in one shape, form or other, because um, it seems like there's uh, there's 57 different headlines around BlackRock, you know, in their, in their fingers and in, the, in very many different pies. And you know, and and that's I'm saying that flippantly and jokingly, but I think that's a good thing, right? So they're, they're getting involved, they're showing they're serious about their approach and the the dive into digital assets as a broad scope, right? And you know, and that's why they are so headline heavy at the moment. You know, one of the things that came up, one of their executives, who has obviously been involved in ETFs and such for a long, long time, came out and said they believe the SHC is going to uh, more than likely approve um, all the spot Bitcoin ETFs at once, um, which would make sense. So we've kind of discussed this on and off and not led into it that, you know, straight against the wall that, you know, all of them will be done in one go, but that kind of makes more sense. It does make more sense. And look, we know, and we've talked about this before, when BlackRock submitted their application for the ETF, theirs was different than any that had had come before it. They had obviously taken their time to think through what some of the uh, denials or some of the issues the SEC had before and try to create a, a proposal and an application that solved quite a bit of that. And so then everyone else who came after just said, we're just going to copy and paste what BlackRock did, right? It's public information. Anyone can go look at it. So they just copied and pasted. It. So it completely makes sense that once the SEC approves one, they kind of have to approve them all because if they don't do that, it's kind of the SEC playing favorites, right? If if BlackRock gets approved or ARC gets approved first, because I think ARC is first in in line. I think they're January, whereas uh, I think BlackRock's you know final kind of drop dead date is in March. But if ARC gets approved and no one else does, well, then all those billions of dollars are going to flow into ARC and nobody else. And why, when BlackRock gets approved, is anyone going to move their money from one to another? They're all going to be pretty much the same. So I think in in an effort to play fair, and I, you know, say that very tongue in cheek when I'm referring to the SEC, but in an effort to play fair, I think if they're going to approve, yes, they have to approve them all at once. Yes, I um, let's not put fair and the SEC into the same sentence again. But uh, yeah, no, it totally makes sense, and it's you know, it's got to be a level playing field for the most part, and you know, they're they're all in there, so it's not like anyone's coming late to the party. So we will see. Um, and again, on BlackRock, um, we've talked about the tokenization of ETFs along the way over the last several weeks as well, and uh, whether it's on money market funds or, or um, other ETFs for uh, bond issuances. There's a BACT has launched a tokenized BlackRock ETF on, on the base network. Um, how's this all work? This is, again, BlackRock headlines. Exactly. This is the the idea of tokenization, putting it on base. And, and of course, base is the layer two network that Coinbase launched um, I don't know, several months ago. Uh, and, and by the way, has had quite a bit of traffic and quite a, a few transactions and is earning revenue. Um, but backed finance launched this tokenized version of a of a BlackRock fund on base. And what that means, many is pretty much anyone with a base wallet is now able to trade this, um, you know, the, this tokenized version of a BlackRock ETF. I think it's uh, important and interesting as we start to talk about those RWAs, those real world assets, right? And how they exist on chain. Um, 
and and honestly, I think the SEC is probably going to have something to say about this because you have a uh, registered security at BlackRock ETF now available to just about anybody, whether or not those people go through KYC or anything like that. So I, I think um, the SEC might have something to say about this, but it will be an in- it's an interesting experiment. It's interesting to see what the uptake is going is is going to be. Uh, for people potentially all over the world that want to, you know, participate and buy this BlackRock ETF, but don't want to have a U.S.-based uh, brokerage account to do so, it does bring simplicity and globalization to the whole platform. So it's it's definitely bringing another layer of of well, you know, we can call it efficiency, whatever we want, but it's fresh money, baby. Um, yeah. So you know, it's everyone's happy. And you know, guess who else is jumping on the bandwagon? I guess JP Morgan is as well. They uh, they got involved in their first uh, blockchain based collateral settlement transaction involving none other than BlackRock and uh, and Barclays. So you know, everyone's getting involved, and in this collateralization of these tokens is is kind of it's also awesome. sorry the tokenization of these right. these products, money market, yeah, I, I, ETFs, whatever it is. Yeah. I, I think it's great. I think they're obviously they're going to be speed bumps in in there. Um, but what they're seeing with JP Morgan, what BlackRock, what Barclays, but all these other companies that have that have implemented some level of tokenization program uh, along the last few months that you and I have been talking about extensively. What they're talking about is this can save us um, in operational costs. It can save us uh, back office fees which to me also means we're letting go of some people once this really starts working because we don't need people processing a lot of these transactions. What it does is it increases transparency. It obviously significantly decreases settlement time, which increases the ability to utilize these assets in, in the with the idea of collateralization, right? I can use that asset. If, if JP Morgan can do it, then I can use my BlackRock ETF as collateral for a loan. Why shouldn't I be able to do that if JP Morgan can do it? Um, and the technology is going to be there to allow that. In the past, it's only been the likes of the big banks and the institutions that have been able to do that. And I think a lot of this technology is going to bring it down market to where you and I are going to have the same capabilities as some of the institutions. For now, I think it's really interesting, of course, that JP Morgan has done this. And, and it's interesting that, that also that you and I say this over and over again, because JP Morgan and Jamie Dimon have been so anti-crypto uh, at the top levels. And behind the scenes, they're doing probably as much or more than any large institution or bank in the realms of tokenization, uh, of utilizing blockchain technology. And all that feeds into the value of of um, networks like Ethereum and therefore the value of tokens like ETH, right? The value of networks like Polygon or, or Solana that might be being utilized and therefore the value of those tokens. So they're actually perpetuating and helping the value of those uh, of those networks and those crypto assets, even though at the very top levels, they say, we don't really need these and we don't like them. At the bottom levels, they're going, oh, we can really help, like this can really help us with you know, operational costs. This can help us with settlement times. And therefore, this can help us with collateralization. And, and I, I know someone on LinkedIn today posted that the, the tokenization is uh, just kind of theater and, is, and it's taking the our eyes off of what's happening with Bitcoin and ETH. But in reality, the tokenization, even if it causes very, very small increases in efficiency for those firms, Right, the firms we that you and I have talked about in the last several weeks are J.P. Morgan, BlackRock, Barclays, Citi, Deutsche, uh, and probably a few others. I think that I added them up. It's like three hundred thirty billion dollars worth of revenue in the last year. If you could save like two percent by utilizing blockchain technology, that's a monumental amount of money that flows to the stockholders of those companies, right? And it means they're going to keep doing it. If they can save 2%, they're going to do what they can and save 3% and 4% and 5%, right? And all of that translates into adoption of, of the technology, adoption of blockchain technology, and therefore flows through to the tokens. It has so many other ramifications on the, the financial system, on the value of crypto and all these other things, just from this one little incident or, or this one little test that JP Morgan did using BlackRock and Barclays. Wow, that's some. A- RWS and real world savings. 
Real, yeah, real world savings. We'll take it. I think that's our new one. You and I are coining that. We're now the cool kids. <laughs> we will be the cool kids. Adam, there's, listen, there's always food for thought when we leave these conversations. So thank you for sharing your thoughts as always. Of course. Thank you for having me, Mehdi. And I'd urge our viewers, don't forget to check out Adam's course on digital assets and crypto education, interaccess.io. Check it out. Until next time, thank you for watching. Stay on the crypto revolution and good luck investing.